please leave them until the end um, and we will um, go through those. We can do the, the raise hand feature and we can go through and, and get some questions answered. So um, with that, I'll start it off um, with a little bit of background. So the Salinas River has a serious Arundo Donax problem. Um, back before we started our eradication program, the uh, total acreage of Arundo in the river was mapped at around 1,500 acres and growing. Um, so these large dense stands that the Arundo forms poses a flood risk hazard to surrounding lands, primarily, primarily agricultural land. Um, the Arundo uses a lot more water than native vegetation. And of course it outcompetes native plants and takes over really important habitat for wildlife that use the riparian corridor. So to address these issues, uh, the RCD built on some work that was started by the Monterey County Agricultural Commissioner. Uh, we developed permits for a riverwide program and started our program in 2014. Uh, next slide, please. So our typical methods include first doing um, a biomass reduction, and that's done with really large, intense masticators. And uh, that basically reduces the Arundo down to a mulch layer. Next slide. So you can see in the above photo, that's after um, mowing this big dense Arundo stand, uh, there's just a mulch layer left. Uh, but then what happens is that the Arundo regrows. We do the biomass reduction to, to kind of get rid of a lot of the really tall woody material. Um, but then because Arundo is a grass, it regrows. So the bottom photo shows regrowth. Um, that's in less than a year of, of regrowth after mowing. Um, and that's probably about eight feet tall, that Arundo in that bottom photo. Um, but it makes it a little more uniform and easy to spray. So this fo um, these photos show the spray treatments that we do after mowing the regrowth. We do an initial herbicide treatment um, the second year. And then next slide, we follow. So this is a, another before and after the spray. Um, on the left, that's showing the regrowth. On the right, um, you can see this has been sprayed and really, really good control. Um, but the Arundo canes still stand for a while before they, they break down. So that's kind of showing what it looks like um, after an effective spray treatment. And then we, um, we do retreatments, just spot treatments from there on out. We get a little bit of <clears throat> a rundo coming back and we'll, we'll go back through and treat that. So most of the intense work is done in the first two years. And I think that's all. Oh, no, I was gonna just a quick overview of where we are. So. Um, we're currently in our ninth season um, of work. We have treated um, almost all the Arundo along about 50 river miles, so about halfway down the river. We're currently working downstream of Soledad, like between Soledad and Gonzales, and going back and doing retreatments where needed. So the focus of the study that we'll be talking about today um, is areas that we mowed in 2019, so around Soledad. Um, in King City. And then we also uh, looked at areas that were mowed back in 2014 at the very beginning of the program as a comparison, just to look at um, areas that have been under treatment for, for a longer amount of time. Okay, done with that, I'll turn it over. Um, thank you, Tanya and Higa. I'll let you introduce yourselves. And Emily, thank you very much. Here. Yes. Everyone, thank you very much for joining us. We're excited to present everything we have learned from this amazing project. I'm seeing a lot of familiar names, but for anyone who doesn't know us, my name is Ahiga Sandoval. I'm a wildlife researcher and co-owner of Pathways for Wildlife. I am the other co-owner and wildlife ecologist at Pathways for Wildlife. So uh, just a little bit about what we do. Uh, we specialize in conducting wildlife connectivity studies. So we have a focus on how wildlife move across the landscape, how they travel throughout valley floors. We specialize in road ecology, so how wildlife interact with highways and roads. But today we're going to but we'll be highlighting how we monitored wildlife throughout the Salinas River. Our methodology includes collecting GPS coloring data, tracking data, so this is the most precise form of data other than live sighting, identifying animal prints, 
And my personal favorite, camera data. So we place cameras in remote locations and they give us uh, insight into where and which species are crossing by, but also they give us a unique look at animal behavior, such as this beautiful badger that we recorded for our wonderful partners at Mid Peninsula Regional Open Space District. And now the moment we have all been waiting for, a rundo donax, also called elephant grass, river reed. It has numerous names. Everyone says that mountain lions have a lot of names, but I think a rundo has that beat. This stuff grows in dense patches. It has evolved to grow very close together, creating many natural barriers. And today we're gonna to be highlighting some of the issues that wildlife face when they come across a rundo. So the, the purpose of the Salinas River Wildlife Monitoring Study is to determine if clearing a rundo improves ability for wildlife movement through various sites throughout the Salinas River. Our study focused on areas that were highly constricted by a rundo. So in August 2019, we set up an array of cameras, motion activated cameras for a 24 month monitoring period. This timeline was selected so we were able to collect baseline data on wildlife movement before two treatments to remove a run were performed. And as Emily mentioned, these two treatments include mowing and then spring. We used the wildlife movement data collected before the Arundo treatments were performed to compare wildlife movement data to post treatments to assess if the rundo clearing uh, was effective. Here is a look at our study area. So it's right along the Salinas River. We have five different sites running north to south. And we were really excited because we didn't know what we would find in Salinas River. There's really been no mammal studies um, and data collected. So not only are we determining the study's uh, objectives and questions, we're also creating a great baseline of data of animal movement within the Salinas River. And for those who aren't familiar with the Salinas River, because of the food safety issues, there's large fencing put up along most of the, the stream channel. Um, so it's really funneling animals through Salinas River. So it's a fascinating question about what animals are using the riverbed, how many animals are down there um, in this very uh, constricted and constrained area. So we were pretty excited when we found that at all sites we were recording deer. In fact, it was the highest rate of detections for all sites combined. It was 1,865. There's a lot of wild pigs there, but unfortunately they're everywhere on the landscape these days. Um, but we were really excited because there's also a high amount of coyote and bobcat detections. One thing I want to clarify is if you could go back um, with these detections, it's not that there was 1,865 deer <laughs> um, individuals that were recorded. A lot of these deer could be the same individual but recorded at different time frames, maybe one, one time in the morning and then later in the evening uh, that we would record a female with a fawn and they would be routinely um, recorded throughout the different um, months on different days. So we just wanted to be clear that um, we didn't record 494 individual bobcats, but detections. So let's jump into the data. It was really exciting. So the highest biodiversity of species recorded were at sites three, four, and five. And what made this really interesting and exciting for us is that these sites had a smaller percentage of arundo growing versus the other study sites. And these sites consisted mostly of native vegetation. And we'll talk about why there was more native vegetation later in the study. But we felt this could account for a higher biodiversity recorded at these sites. And now, beginning with one of our favorite sites, we move all the way down south to site three, which is down here in King City. So just to begin, the picture on the left is Emily and Higa. We went and set up cameras and had a lot of fun doing that. But just for scale, that Arundel grows high and it's miles long and it's so thick and dense. And then the picture above is an example of after mowing and we recorded the deer. So going to site three, it was really exciting because the mowing also resulted in opening up pathways to the river. So the animals didn't have a lot of access to the river. So this is an example of the great benefits of mowing, making it much easier for animals to access the river. So we would set up our cameras. This was a before treatment. So we would get baseline data before the mowing. And then we record what was moving through after mowing. This is another site that was treated. So here's pretty much what we were recording before mowing. 
a lot of rodents, rabbits, that was really the only things that were moving through before mowing or spraying occurred. It was just so dense, so it created great habitat for rodents. But then the mowing, so this was so fascinating. So these pictures are examples of after the mowing and there was a great amount of movement. So we had only were recording rabbits at the site before, and then we were recording animals like deer moving through, and not just once in a while, but on a consistent basis each month. Again, at the top in different species as well, deer, bobcats, uh, deer consistently moving, but then um, on the bottom pictures, you can see the renda starts to grow back and then it starts to grow really tall and thick as the picture to the right. Again, another treated site. Here's the camera picture of what it was recording before the treat treatment. Then the mowing opened it up, then we were recording deer, bobcats, but then again, to the picture to the right, this, uh, the rendos start to grow back. So there's a pattern here. And we would see that over and over, but it was also really fun because we were recording, uh, as I mentioned, this was the same bobcat. So when I said we knew it was the same bobcat, how do we know? Bobcats are really fun because the leg stripe pattern is the same on um, same individuals, much like freckles on our arms. So we were able to identify that this bobcat moved through twice um, in January 2020. We also love to put our cameras on video because then we can also record uh, behavioral information. So not these animals weren't just moving through back and forth to access water. It was also creating areas where this bobcat could hunt. And then just fun interactions between animals. I thought this was a date that went awry. awry. <laughs> and so we set up cameras at treated and control sites. So the control sites were more open areas because we wanted to be able to compare between a controlled site, which was more open throughout the year versus the treated sites where um, it was very dense and it was open. So here's a picture of two bobcats at a controlled site, but then we just saw that there was a bobcat um, moving through one of the treated sites. So that's why we had the control and treated sites paired together. And again, I mentioned that baseline data, really fun. Recorded a red fox. A lot of folks think a oh, red fox are just more in urban, urban areas, but it was really interesting to find red fox, but we also were recording gray fox as well. And here is a perfect size comparison of a bobcat with that red fox. And again, what we're really highlighting in this area is seeing how the wildlife are moving through the already treated areas. So the most natural thoroughfare in along the Salinas River. So then it was time to graph up the data and that's when things got really fascinating. We were having a lot of fun seeing the data and entering the data and talking with Emily every month about what we were learning. But then when we graphed it out, became quite interesting. So the blue line is the controlled uh, cameras uh, lumped together. And then the orange line are the treated cameras combined together. And so you can see that there's a pattern. So where it spikes is when their mowing occurred in 20, uh, October 2019. And then the spring occurred later in 2020. And you can see there's a smaller spike. Next. So that was really interesting. So there was an increase in wildlife movement and detections after mowing, a big increase. And then as the render grew back, you could see there was very few detections, in fact, zero detections. But then after the spring occurred, we had a smaller spike. So we were like, hmm, it looks like the treatments are effective, increasing the permeability landscape because we were uh, recording the increase of wildlife movement and detections after the treatments. And with that, we're gonna to move to another site, our very first site, furthest north, site one. Now this is the perfect picture to show how things were during camera setup. So during camera setup, we act, I, I actually crawled in the Arundo to see and set the camera station up in the thickest parts of it, knowing that it would get mowed and sprayed uh, post-treatment. So this picture is prior treatment during camera setup. And this is the uh, perspective from the camera's view, what it looks like. So you can see how closely the Arundo strands are together. And here you have some data that we collected, again, mainly only birds, rabbits, and rodents. To the right, we have a bobcat going through the area that was mowed. Now, within the year, the sprouts of the Arundo started shooting up and they grew about five feet high. So rapid growth 
and you can see it's trying to revert back to what it was during initial setup. So this is a perfect example of how Coyotes go through and move through a sprayed and mowed completely treated area. We also have Bobcat. This is one of my favorite videos because you can see the coyotes are exploring. It's like, wow, this was tall or rendo thick grass stands. And now the landscapes open up and they're able to move. And again, at this site, we recorded both male, females, male deer. And this also allowed us to do antler morphology. So we could determine how many different male individuals were at a given site when they had their tines and they could be, be compared to counting the number of tines. But as the rondo began to grow, we found a decrease in wildlife detection. So as it grew taller and thicker, we had a big decline in detections. So look how this bobcat moves through. This Arundo has been sprayed. It has been treated with the spraying, uh, but look how it moves through. It's crunchy, it's loud. We didn't get too much bobcat activity. Now it has to walk around instead of through. So we definitely were finding that it, it's critical to have multiple treatments. And um, this has been kind of the bad news. There was good news and the bad news, but uh, after multiple treatments, as we'll talk about at different sites, it's very effective in restoring the landscape. So we found that when your treatment is great and initially creating permeability, but you really need multiple years, otherwise it just goes back to this. So here is site one and the different colored lines. So uh, the blue and the orange are the controlled, and then the gray and the yellow are the treated. So you could see similar patterns and after there's mowing, there's a spike after post mowing. So an increase of detections, a decline as the render grows up. And then after spring, there's a smaller spike, um, not as large as after mowing. So the mowing is definitely very effective in opening up the landscape, um, but then there's a spike with spring. So after that, let's move to site two. It is just south of site one and is near the confluence of the Salinas River and the Arroyo Seco. And this is perfect. Again, the top left is a great illustration of how the Arundo grew thick, dense. Nothing was traveling through it except for rodents. To the right, we have a completely treated area. Now, what we did was Emily had a good idea of putting up a stake at one foot intervals to measure the growth, and to give us an example of the size of wildlife passing by, but the rapid growth was extremely fascinating. So here's a deer right next to the stake, a coyote, and then a year later, you have the Arundo. Not only has the height outgrown the stake, but the density was uh, astronomical. Like the, the fact that it got so dense, it, you could see the deer approaching, and what we did was with our behavior of the camera data, animals would approach and then move around. It was impenetrable. Again, perfect rabbit displaying that density. And we are also excited to see a red fox at a different site uh, compared to the southern portion. And you can see the stake here. This was after the, another round of complete treatment and a deer. So lots of movement when the visual blockade was removed. And here's an example of the regrowth. So you can see the stake through the Arundo and the third uh, tape, which is three feet, and it has outgrown the stake within a year. And this picture is just so powerful showing the coyote. So here's an a, a area of dead Arundo. It has been sprayed, not mowed. So it is dead. And this area was the control, uh, open and Wildlife would just move around the Arundo. So with that, let's move to our sites with the highest biodiversity, sites four and five, right in the heart of the study area. So I mentioned that there was some, some good news. And so what was really exciting is, uh, and I also had a trick idea of monitoring an area that had multiple treatments. So here's site four and five, which had previously gone through several treatments. These treatments include being mowed in fall 2014, and then sprayed in 20, sorry, spring 2015, 
then summer 2016, summer 2017, and summer 2018. The treatments resulted in terrific successful restoration of habitat within the study site. The majority of these two sites consisted of native vegetation, such as chaparral, coyote brush, annual grasses, and native shrubs, with very few and sparse arenda stands. And we were really excited, multiple species, species movement on a consistent basis with both the treated control. So unlike sites one, two, and three, where it was undergoing initial treatments, here throughout the year, both through treated and the control, we got multiple species movements. And this is one of my favorite pictures because it actually has the pinnacles is the backdrop there with this least river running through. Male, female deer, very happy coyotes at both the control and treated sites. And we're pretty excited. We record uh, birds as well. So really cool roadrunner picture. One of the most powerful things about the uh, video footage is th these sites are, uh, because they've been mowed so um, frequently, they give access to the river. The other sites, the Arundo blocks the river and wildlife have to navigate to it. At these sites, sites four and five, the river is easily accessible. So a lot, a lot more healthier looking animals and a lot more detections. You can see it's just much easier for this deer to walk right down down to the river. What was really interesting about looking at this data is that it became really powerful with looking at the different spikes of movement because movement in a healthy restored landscape, there's usually a, a pattern and it's a reflection of typical mammal species movement patterns, which include things like searching for food and water during different seasons, but then males looking for mates in early spring and juveniles dispersing a fall winter to establish their own home range to, this is critical because they also need um, to move through different habitat patches. So both fights, sites four and five are a good reflection of those types of animal movement patterns throughout the year. Juveniles dispersing, then you have your mating season, then the juveniles disperse again, and then a mating season. And then you can see that both the control and treated areas are following that flow of typical mammal movement patterns that we find throughout the year. Um, that there was uh, less in the treated, but again, unlike sites one through three, where you only saw a spike right after mowing, a big spike, and then a little spike after the spring, you saw consistent movement throughout the year, those consistent spikes that you typically see in healthy ecosystems. And at site four, we were extremely excited to see this awesome animal, American badger, a species of special concern. When we went to go do field work one day, we noticed a ton of badger digs and burrows. You can see the digs here and the throw, perfect badger sign. And we were thrilled to get it on camera. Now, this was a good example of how, the, how successful the project was when there was mowing and spraying. It created a perfect grassland habitat right along Salinas River. And since this was our highest biodiversity area, we were excited to see badger. And then what really blew us away is we had a lot of sighting of a burring owl. Both these are grassland specialists. So the multiple treatments over the years had restored, successfully restored this into a grassland habitat along with Chevron Chaparral. And I'm sure as many of you know, the burring owls, it's quite a predicament, especially at Ani. We're getting less and less owls. So this was really exciting to find not only a grassland specialist like a badger that is sensitive to human disturbance, but a burring owl, another grassland specialist. So we thought these were good indicator species of the success of multiple years of treatment and restoring the habitat. Moving over to site, so that was site four, here's site five. Multiple species, male and females, all throughout the year. And we also got this beautiful roadrunner. Running. You can see the native vegetation is almost flourishing in this area. Bobcat, and the most interesting thing is when you have the visual blockade of the Arundo removed, you see more breeding in the area, such as these cute little bobcat kittens. And we and feel this really increases the conservation value of the habitat threefold. 
because now the habitat's providing resources such as access to food and water. But number two, breeding's occurring. Number three, it gives the ability for those juveniles to disperse, all critical things that we need for healthy animal populations. So looking at sites four and five at the control treated, as I mentioned before, those are those patterns we're used to seeing throughout the year, where you see those different movement spikes due to breeding, looking for resources, doing that dispersal. Now let's look at sites one through three. Not that typical movement pattern that you would expect to see. We see a spike after post mowing because it increased the permeability of the landscape for those animals to move and do those critical movement patterns, but then a huge decline down in um, early spring as the rundle grew. And then a little spike after post spring is effective, but really, it really goes to show, next slide, that multiple treatments over multiple years have resulted in successfully restoring native habitats, allowing for the regeneration of grassland habitats at site four and five. And we found that at these sites, the treatments resulted in improving the permeability of the sites as there was an increase in um, the data at the camera stations. And uh, it is extremely important to point out that our data indicate that mowing is the most effective, spraying and mowing together, because it removes that physical barrier. So when wildlife are traversing throughout a landscape and you have the Arundo in dense patches, they tend to block it, they can't go through, so they pick alternative routes. So after spraying, our data indicate that the stalks are still there. Even though the Arundo is dead, the stalks remain, it's still dense, and wildlife cannot move through it. But when you have the combination of spraying and mowing, it removes the visual blockade, it removes that physical barrier, and wildlife are moving through, such as this coyote. And as Emily mentioned, having multiple years of spraying, so those dead stalks break down, and then treating, so those little Arundos that want to be the new generation also get treated and eventually break down. So it was, it was really an exciting study to look at areas that were just being treated and comparing a study site with multiple years. And, and I want to thank Emily for, it was her idea, this was brilliant, um, really excited to have collected baseline data in an area where there wasn't a lot of information and tying in um, restoration uh, efforts along with wildlife connectivity and movement. And with that, we would like to thank the Resource Conservation District of Monterey County for their partnership and the awesome ideas they had. We would also like to thank the Wildlife Conservation Board for funding this amazing study. As I mentioned, Emily, that was just amazing to do this project together over multiple years. It also was really great to have multiple years of data instead of just one year to really you know, sink our teeth into the data. And then we also wanna thank all the landowners who gave us access to the properties. That was critical and we so appreciate their collaboration on it. And with that, everybody, thank you very much. We came a little under time. We were worried with all the Dang, you just we went. went. <laughs> Good job. Thank you so much um, for that presentation. It's always fun to see all those photos. Um, I'll just say, I think my kind of take home from this, and I'm so glad that, that we did the monitoring in the sites that we had started treatment on in 2014 because it really shows that, you know, if you only looked at the ones where we treated in 20 or 2019, you would get this, this picture of like, okay, mowing is great, the animals start moving through, but then once the rondo grows back, well, then you're screwed again, there's no more movement, um, you know, but what we're seeing is that after the spraying, it takes a while for those arundo canes to decay and to break down. And when we're going back through with the follow-up treatment, um, we're preventing that infestation from coming back. And it's just, it just takes a little time, you know, it just takes a little time for the, the ecosystem to recover, for, um, for that to happen. But then once that, that starts happening, those canes break down and remove that physical barrier, then we're really getting um, more wildlife moving through. So um, it's very exciting to, to see those results. Thank you. Um, does anybody have questions? You can use under reactions, there's a raise hand feature, you can do it that way. Um, Norm, we can start with you. Yeah, thank you. And I appreciate this fascinating information. Really appreciate the presentation here and all the photos, really good. Um, um, my question is, is there any correlation between the detections that you saw on wildlife and whether or not there was water in the river channel itself in those study areas? 
that's a really great question. We actually didn't look at that um, in terms of uh, making every time we checked the camera, what was the water levels? Um, that's a great question. And we're, we're lucky enough that it seemed to be um, most of the parts where we were monitoring did have water. It, it, it got it got very low um, during the summer years, um, but I don't think we recorded any parts where it just became bone dry. That's a, that's a great question. And yeah, there was a few times, Norm. Uh, the good thing is though, like usually we're used to seeing wildlife with mange or they just look, they look very thin. Uh, they don't look as healthy, but a lot of the wildlife along this river and all study sites, uh, they look very healthy. Like the coyotes that you've seen, even the badger, like everything looked very uh, healthy out there. So it was really good. And the water level did get low. Uh, for example, at in Greenfield sites four and five, when we used to walk through, there's like this big bridge and Salinas River would go under it. And usually it's, it's not very deep, it's shallow, but it's wide. And there was a few months where it was just like bare, just sand. And you could see just like all the tracks in there. Um, it did open it up for movement though. So like smaller species could just walk through that. But um, yeah, we didn't notice that. But that's a great point because uh, the need for permeability where it does become dry, dried up, animals do need to move further up or down the river then to find areas where there is still water. So great question. That'd be a great phase three study. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Norm. Anybody else? Or if you want to put your um, questions in the chat, that would work too. Henry. You're still muted, Henry. Yeah. Oh, anybody else while Henry's maybe getting his safety uh, there? One thing we want to know is uh we didn't record a mountain lion on camera, but there was uh, live observations. Um, oh, there can you hear me now? You can see me now. Mm -hmm. So I, I was wondering uh, uh, if you had any data about a an area of, of the river or another similar river where just the, the native uh, species have uh, are, are, are fully grown out and what the movement of, of, uh, of wildlife is there compared to, to the two scenarios that you just showed, the, the, the dense Arondo versus the, uh, the mode. Uh, so I'm, my, my guess is that the mode kind of artificially uh, allowed for wildlife to move through versus a, uh, an area that's just uh, uh, fully uh, grown out with, uh, with native uh, vegetation. Uh, but I don't know if you're aware of any, any, any data that would, that would show that. I, I don't even know if that's of any importance, but uh, I would just made me wonder. Emily, what do you think? I think sites four and five had the most native vegetation, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, and, for sure. And, and they also had, so like those sites were like the highest in, in diversity of species that we got. So like you would see the majority of like bobcat, deer, coyote, you would see pig, but you would see other species just traveling through. And it was that the uh, sites with the highest, like the most uh, uh, vegetative um, diversity too. So I think that like, and it's, it's like not even close. Those are the two highest sites where we got that. Okay, is, do you have other studies that, or where you've done work in other places that are more natural is that kind of what you're getting at henry like more like areas that are that don't have big nasty infestations of, of rondo and what those what those areas look like compared to what we found actually that's a really great question so for the big sur land trust we did studies years ago and we were actually monitoring on either side of the Salinas river <clears throat> and that was really exciting because we were able to compare, like you're saying, we had a study where we were monitoring wildlife at Fort Ord National Monument and over at Mark's Ranch at Big Sur property. And what was really interesting, I think this goes to your question, is we found that the same species that we were recording at Fort Ord, we were finding in the river as well. And, and that study included a mount line, which actually helped protect. We uh, uh, got, thank you to the WCB, got funding many, many years ago 
to protect uh, Mark's Ranch because we found a mountain lion traveling through Mark's Ranch, going under through Salinas River, Fort Ord, and then back again. So that's one thing, and we built that this work that the RCD is doing so critical is because it's not just rodents and opossums and raccoons. I love them too, um, but there's all the animals you find in healthy ecosystems are in the Salinas River, and that blew us away because it's so constricted and then with the fencing. So the, the work that RCD is so doing, not just restoring the, um, the habitat, but be creating healthy habitat because all those same animals are down in the river system, which was really interesting. Yeah, I wonder, I, I, it always makes me think about other connections because like you said, the, the food safety issues mean that the farmers have to put up like really tall exclusion fencing um, along the farm fields, which kind of constrains the animals into those areas, but there are drainages that come down and there are connections to other um, other areas. And so that's that's something that we've been interested in just in the broader impacts of the overall program is how, um, how animals moving through the river might be accessing populations, you know, having greater population connectivity in other areas. So do you want to talk about that at all, Tanya? And oh, yeah, what talk about areas about that are important that are yeah. connected, like up at the pinnacles or? Yeah, that's a great talk about a phase three. I think a, a study that would be so valuable is exactly what Emily is saying. So we were just looking along the, the Salinas River, but how, how does Salinas River connect over to either side of the mountain ranges? And at one site, Arroyo Seco, um, connects up to the Sierra de Salinas and it runs down into the Salinas River. And then you have um, another river system, oh, it just escaped my mind the, the name of the, the river, but it runs up to the pinnacles. So it would be really fascinating to see if animals are using these two rivers that have a confluence with Salinas River and are moving back and forth up between the mountain ranges. Um, because that's a lot of the work we do um, is looking at you know, how is the Santa Cruz Mountains connected to the Dabla Range? So um, how are the pinnacles corrected over to the DRC, Sierra de Salinas? And that's critical um, because as many of you know, the mountain lions, the Central Coast mountain lion population this year might become a listed species. Um, there's been a great statewide study looking at the genetics of the mountain lions and our Central Coast mountain lions are actually doing quite poorly. They have a very low genetic effective population size. Um, and as you see, it's just hard for animals to cross our valley floors. They're so fragmented. So that's another thing we've always kept in mind is, you know, how are the animals moving to the uphills between the mountain ranges crossing the Salinas River? And I don't think there's a lot of opportunities, perhaps the King City as well. But yeah, that Arroyo Seco confluence going up to the pinnacles, I think is probably critical and looking, you know, is that stream channel open? Are, there, are they using the bridges under the highways? Um, and especially if the, the mountain lion does become a illicit species, that might be an important question to answer. Great, Lynn. Yeah, that just was reminding me for us over in San Benito County, how critical it is for us to ensure we continue to have that open space for the animals. And we have a lot of landowners who are becoming more and more interested in conservation easements. Uh, California Rangeland Trust has worked a lot with them, um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And so to the extent that there are certain areas that have greater importance toward uh, the wildlife movement and connectivity to the Salinas River and others less so, we'd love to you know, just keep us in mind. And we'd love to have discussions with folks if that comes up. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you. Great presentation. Thank you, because I worked on that for, with Emily on this project. Yeah, too. Lynn was <laughs> out there looking for animals. <laughs> um, and then so Dawn, Dawn has been a huge, you know, um, she's been out there quite a lot doing our pre-activity surveys for our rental control work. And Dawn, you put a comment in the chat. Do you want to talk about that at all? Oh, I was just saying that um, um, the the good questions that were asked about um, the water, surface water um, availability during those times, um, there is existing data. Um, I have some actually in my files and I'd be happy to look that up and give that to you guys if you wanna go back and plot that against your data. Um, so that's on file um, for some of these sites. And also, 
you know, when we were surveying underneath that arundo was so thick that oftentimes just to make it across, we would look for the mature trees, the mature native trees, because underneath those mature native trees, it was open. It, that was our access, our way to go through while doing surveys. So um, if we were behaving a lot like a lot of the large animals <laughs> out there would. Think like a mountain lion. <laughs> yeah, but these animals um, really are also restricted just by the large, large linear areas of fencing from the farm. So, boy, if you can work with Lynn and other organizations for um, movement quarters just out of that riparian quarter altogether, that would be fantastic. Yeah, thank you, Don. I wish I would have talked to you sooner because I just walked right through the Arundo. I was like, I just want to see how far I could put this camera in there. And it was tough. And that's wonderful about the data. I think that would be really interesting to plot that because Norm, your question about that was so good. I'm I'm so curious now to see if, yeah. if any of the water correlates with the spikes or at different areas. Do we have more animals um, in areas where they it held water longer? And um, yeah, lastly to your point, Don, uh, Boy, I thought out of the 15 years of doing wildlife connectivity research, this was such an interesting project because, you know, I thought roads were a big problem. Here, it's not just the roads, but the rendo and then the, the wildlife exclusionary fencing. So I, I think it's one of the most critical areas to be investing in making it more permeable. Long Did you have data on the road runners as well. That's just, that just rocks. <laughs> that was so much fun. <laughs> Yeah, see, that's why we put it on video because I was like, I want to get it running. I want to see how they're actually moving through these areas. Um, Norm, I think, do you have another question? Your hands up. Yeah, I do. And, and I was just curious, we didn't see any pictures of feral pigs. So I'm just wondering how you <laughs> noted those detections and whether or not that was just a choice not to include pictures. But moreover, did you notice any destructive behavior of the feral pigs? Yeah, so Norm, like I... I, I like all wildlife. Like I like seeing them. I saw numerous pigs out there. We didn't include them because, well, I don't know why we didn't include them. Tanya, why didn't we include pigs in there? Because I think right, they're, they're cute. They're in the like, grass. Yeah, <laughs> they're they're, they the they're yeah. the data analysis of, yeah, we yeah. just didn't include them, but um, at every site there was multiple pigs yeah. and families of pigs and they were quite the commuters. In fact, uh, we walked along a lot of their trails even to access areas because it was so heavy use. And they would also mess with their cameras and, you know, scrape on our camera so yeah definitely a lot of wild pig down there um for sure but uh we didn't see like huge air like so i was concerned that you know as the native vegetation was trying to grow you know if they come through and you just see them like little tractors we yeah. saw a lot of rooting but not like huge damage to the reed growth yeah not compared to other studies we've done like sometimes you'll see them and they're like there's like 30 of them together uh here i think like 12 15 8 was like the average around there uh at different study sites yeah. um so yeah they were they were definitely there but um they didn't seem to impede the other wildlife movement and some areas they just take over but uh yeah, yeah. they were there uh yeah. we, we do have a, a question in the chat which is right up my alley from nikki it's a techie question. What type and model of wildlife camera was used in the study and what was the capacity of the SD cards? How long between camera visits to download the data? Okay, so for us, we wanted to have 4K cameras and there's a few um, brands that do this. Um, now they all do, but at the time we were using Stealth Cam, Stealth Cam 4K, uh, the DS4K. And the reason we like those cameras is because a lot of studies, what you'll see is they'll put a camera out, they'll put it on picture, and they'll wait like a month to check it. Um, in the Salinas, around the Salinas River, especially around the Rundo, there's a lot of blowing vegetation, so it's going to fill up the card quickly. And we do set it on the highest setting, so the highest uh, megapixel picture and the highest video, so 4K at like 25 seconds, because we wanted to see that behavior of them moving through the area. Um, so we did check it every two weeks. Which is, which is quite a lot, but uh, it allowed us to stay on top and minimize the data gaps, although there were still some because it's just the nature of the landscape. Um, and also another thing is that camera, it takes video and picture simultaneously. So like uh, the other cameras that do this are Bushnell. So like they'll do, what they'll do is they'll take a picture and then they'll take a video. But with the stealth cams, they take a video, they have two sensors, they'll take a video and a picture at the same time. So it's the StealthCan DS4K. 
And these poor guys had a lot of camera theft, unfortunately, in some places um, on the river. So they're nice, fancy, <laughs> expensive cameras were getting picked off. Yes. But so hey, you know what, here's for, for everyone who does camera research, here is the law that I was taught. And that is this, anything that can be forged can be cut. So just take that in mind. And he's gotten very clever at using galvanized chain and multiple stakes in the ground. And, you know, we're bummed about the cameras, but more it's the data loss. Cause we're like, is that when the mountain lion walked by the camera? So I, I wish they would take the camera and just leave us the SD card. Yeah. <laughs> And I, I put in the chat the, the model of that camera because that it, it is a gem because you, you go to research cameras and each website says, oh, this is the best to fit the best range and trigger speed. And we've we've tried a lot, but this this is definitely the best. Um, the Bushnells, just throw those away. They're, they, they used to be the best, but they're, they're our, our backup camera these days. <laughs> Any other questions or just observations? Because I know some of the folks on this call have been out in the river. Um, does this jive with your your own observations of what you've seen out there, especially over time in areas that we've treated for longer versus um, newer areas that have haven't been treated as as many years? This is me, just, just a thought came to my mind since I was thinking in, in my arena with the stream maintenance program. Um, what do you, is there any data or correlation with uh, successional periods of native uh, vegetation coming back and um, preferred uh, cover for wildlife movement? Um, so. Great question. We, we yeah. felt that um, with the, res the restoration of site four and five, um, finding that badger and, and a burrowing owl um, was a huge uh, indicator of uh, the improvements, you know, the grassland was restored uh, because we don't find badgers in, in a lot of places. They're, they're not common. They're very particular about where, where they go and also burrowing owls. So that, that's a great question because we, we were like, when we found that, we're like, wow, we feel these are indicator species of the success of the restoration of the sites because the grassland's been restored. And badgers, they, they require large um, areas. They have relatively big home ranges. So I was, I was really excited and surprised. And actually, when we first got to the site, we thought we found an old badger burrow that um, was uh, caved in because they tend to move around a lot. So finding that animal um, and the owl that are, you know, truly grassland specialists um, really was a good indication of uh, the restoration of the habitat because we did not find them at any of the other sites. Um, it was more the uh, habitat uh, generalists like deer and coyotes and bobcats that have moved through multiple habitats. But yeah, those, those badgers, we definitely found, we just um, completed a big two-year study with Midpen and did extensive badger work in transects and camera trapping up along the um, peninsula area. And that we, we, we created a model um, and showed, you know, good ha badger habitat and then fair habitat, you know, oak woodland where there is some grassland, but it's more oak woodland. We really found few detections of badgers there, um, just really in that pristine grassland habitat. And then some good areas where we thought we might find badgers, they weren't there. So. That was, we were jumping for joy when we got that badger. Well, first we found the burrows. And then when we got the badger on camera, we were like, success. You know, this really shows that this, this is not, this, and it's, it's hard for badgers to navigate. They, they typically get trapped at median barriers on highways. Fencing's a big problem. Um, so having a badger down there, that was, that was really special. And then we have found that burring owls utilize badger burrows. So we're like, ah, oh, is the owl here because the badger's here and it's creating burrows for the owl to use? So yeah, I, I, that site four will always be a gem in my heart of, of showing how multiple treatments really restored that habitat to have those types of species there. And I and it's good to bring up the stream maintenance program too, which is for some of you who may not know, um, 
there's kind of two large scale vegetation removal programs on the river happening simultaneously. One is the Arundo eradication program and the other is the Salinas River Stream Maintenance Program, which is um, that which Brant uh, manages that program. And that the stream maintenance program involves clearing areas of uh, what we call secondary channels. So, and that's clearing all the vegetation um, routinely. So maybe even every year going in and mowing vegetation um, to open up large channels for water conveyance. But of course, um, that action probably has a lot of benefits also for wildlife movement. And then also keeping uh, those areas in that early successional state where you have more of the herbaceous vegetation growing in those channels, um, you know, it would be interesting to look more into that in, in terms of how those areas, and, and, and Tanya and Higa, you did, you did a study of, of the stream maintenance program a, a couple of years ago, um, looking at that and kind of finding some of the same results with the opening of those channels and wildlife movement through them. But, you know, thinking long-term about keeping, you know, some areas, like as we do all this, this large scale runner removal, that area is gonna get replaced by other vegetation. Um, and so what is that vegetation going to be? Is it gonna be more open grassland type type vegetation or you know, back to willows and back to um, more uh, dense vegetation? And so that's where the stream maintenance program can kind of come in, I think, and help um, if, if the vegetation comes back more dense then the stream maintenance program could help kind of keep some of those areas of connectivity, uh, wildlife connectivity going through the river. Yeah, because Emily, you and I always go back and forth with, you know, these areas that we're restoring or removing a rundo and then, you know, trying to theorize, yeah, okay, so what what state or like what type of habitat or like land cover are we aiming for um, balancing the habitat and just it being a realistic like level that we can manage, so. Yeah, because we don't really want dense riparian vegetation to come back in all these areas, like really thick, dense riparian vegetation. Um, it would be nice to have more of a mosaic of that, like including a lot of those kind of more open grassland areas, both for the, the habitat and also for flood conveyance, you know, flood water conveyance. So those are kind of dual goals there. Along that note, there's um, several species of native wildlife that are coming back. Um, that aren't being picked up by the cameras, that the dense arendo um, stands really do interfere with their movement. One being adult Western pond turtles, that arendo gets so dense that yeah, maybe a, a juvenile pond turtle can get through, but probably not an adult in a lot of places. And they're on the river. Um, there's also um, Northern Harrier hawks, uh, prairie falcons, all kinds of grassland associated species that um, kangaroo rats that are along the river corridor too. So just a reminder that um, this program is benefiting a lot of other species as well as the beautiful ones that we saw today. And I really, another just general comment, this is such a great presentation. I hope you guys really share this data and your findings with the greater community. Thank you, Don. Well, thank you so much. In fact, I was going to email Emily and see if uh, maybe we could present at the, the, the Western Section Wildlife Society conference is coming up. So maybe we, maybe we could take the show on the road. That would be great. Spread the word, yeah. <laughs> well, we just have a couple more minutes. Any, any final questions or final thoughts before we wrap up? I do I do want to say one last thing, just uh, if they are here, thank you to all the landowners because they're extremely helpful with access. Giving access to us is like, is very important. So it's like, they trust us with the gate codes, they're very kind, and they are very responsive. So thank you very much for that. Paul, did you have something to say? I think my only thing was thank you guys for your partnership. <clears throat> and also, <clears throat> I, you know, I I, I, I might have zoned out, but thanks. I want to thank the WCB for their Wildlife Conservation Board for their funding for this work. They've been a critical partner, uh, along with the Ag Commissioner and the local community. Yeah. Yes. 
you know, the WCB is doing amazing work. We've been working with them on other studies and now they're helping fund uh, a wildlife overpass. Don Crocker and I are excited to be building the first wildlife overpass in, in the North area. So there's Liberty Canyon and then there's gonna be the, the Don Crocker Pacheco Pass wildlife overpass. <laughs> oh, and Highway 17. Oh, and then we have Highway 17, which is an undercrossing. So uh, yeah, WCB is critical in making all of this work happen. We're, we're so grateful. All right, well, thank you all um, for attending and for the great comments and questions. And um, thank you so much, Tanya and Higa. It's been so much fun working with you. And it was, it's <laughs> especially during, um, during the pandemic, I was like getting these monthly updates with wildlife <laughs> photos and it would just brighten my day. And I'd share them with the, with the office, like, look, not everything is going you know, horribly, <laughs> like there's badgers. <laughs> so it's really fun to, um, to work with you on this and, um, and thank you for all your work on it. And yes, ditto, definitely thank you for to Wildlife Conservation Board for the funding and support. And um, yeah, so with that, I will say have a great afternoon, everybody. If anybody thinks of extra uh, questions or thoughts, then feel free to share them with, with me and um, Tanya and Ahiga. I'm sure we'll, we'll be happy to hear them. So thank you. Thank everybody. You. Have a good day. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Emily.